In the last videos, we talked about where you find your spouse and how you find your spouse. And we said there, there is no specific setting whereby you, you are going to find your spouse. Everything is, depends on how the Holy Spirit leads you. God has a purpose for every individual. And um, He has a unique way He guides everyone to His will. It is important that we grow a relationship with God and uh, be guided by the Holy Spirit. Everything depends on your context and God is not going to lead you um, ignoring your context, uh, but also not ignoring uh, learning from other people's experiences, maybe getting advice from someone or counseling or anything of that nature, but with the understanding that your situation is unique. Today, we're going to be talking about how do I really know that this is the person that I want to spend the rest of my life with. You see, God has not called us to do good deeds haphazardly. Um, when it comes to defining what God's will is, many of us know that everything that God has written in the Bible is God's will for us. But then, at a certain point, everybody's individual choices are not written in the Bible. The Bible stands as a reference, as a guide, as a foundation to guide us to make decisions and choices in life. And so the Bible would generally talk about something, but it would not get into the specifics of our context and situation. That is when godly guardians is very important. I feel like I want to go to Africa to do mission works or I want to travel to India to help in an orphanage but you see God wants you to to grow a church somewhere in Germany it is not a, a, a bad thing for you to go to Africa to do missions um, or to go to India to work in that orphanage the problem is that um, that is not God's will for you <laughs> he wants you to build a church or to found a church in Germany and so you realize that you may go to Africa and you will not be used effectively the way he would use you uh, to win souls. If at all you respect, um, you trust him to, to discover his will to start a church in Germany. And so we are not called to do good deeds appositely. We have been called to, to do specific things. Everything is enveloped in seeking his will and his will appeals to specifics. He wants us to do specific things. If you look at the people in the Bible, we already talked about this. Um, most of the Bible figures did specific things. They were not doing things haphazardly. They all accomplished specific things and God guided them to do specific things. And now, even when we make mistakes in life, it does happen that God has a way of bringing us back on track through divine adjustments. We're gonna talk about this when we talk, when we get into divorce and remarriage and all that stuff. And so today we want to get into the details of how you know the person you need to marry. Stay tuned. As you know, we are trusting God to build a Christian community. If you didn't subscribe to the channel, I please beg you to subscribe. Um, also share the information with those that are in your own community so we may help edify one another and as you do so, God bless you. Now the question is how do we know the person that God wants us to marry? To answer this question effectively, we need to deep dive into the very composition of a human being. God created the human being in such a way that he would be able to communicate his will to us. Now there are many schools of thought. Um, there are principally two. Um, the school of thought that believe that a human being is made up of a body and a soul. This position is known as dichotomy in theology. And there is the other position that believes that a human being's composition is the body, the spirit, and the soul. And this position is known as trichotomy. If you look at the Bible clearly, you will discover that so many scriptures talk, talk about the body and the soul. 
you can go and look that up for yourself. That is not the main uh, purpose of this video. There are also instances where the soul and the spirit are interchanged. I want to call your attention to a way you come to, you come to conclusions concerning scriptures in the Bible. If you look at the story of Jesus, for instance, you have four Gospels. And the Gospel of Matthew um, begins um, with a long genealogy of Jesus Christ. And then it, it continues the way it does. Why does Matthew begin his Gospel like that? Because he wants to present a, a picture of Jesus Christ as the coming King. And when you move to the book of Mark, you find so many um, works of Jesus Christ. Um, why does Mark use that approach? Because Mark wants to present Jesus Christ as um, a servant. He is someone who came to serve. And so most of the time you find Jesus serving in the book of Mark. When you move to the book of Luke, you, you find instances where Jesus appeals to the flesh. Why? Because the book of Luke tends to present Jesus Christ as um, a human being um, who is able to bear our own infirmities. And um, you find him, you know, sweating and all that stuff. And then you come to the book of John and you find that Jesus has a strange genealogy. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God and so on and so forth. And what you realize, John presents a picture of Jesus Christ as God. You will miss the entirety of the ministry of Jesus Christ or what he came to accomplish if you focus on one uh, gospel. And so you realize that when you put everything together, all the four gospels together, you find Jesus Christ being uh, the king, a servant, a man, and at the end of the day, he is God. And it is this same technique that I think we should apply to um, discovering and the composition of a human being. There are many scriptures that talk about a human being being made, up, being made up of a body and soul. The Bible says when God created us, He breathed in us and we became a living soul, you know. And there are other scriptures that talk about, you know, the body, spirit and soul. Paul says, now may God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now when Paul talks about the body, spirit and soul, I don't think he's drunk. <laughs> I don't think he's making a mistake. I don't think he's foolish. I believe that he, he really believes that there is a body, there is a spirit and there is a soul. Now to my understanding, the way I will look at it is um, the other parts of the scriptures talk about the body and the soul and uh, he brings another revelation telling us that no there is a, another dimension of it the spirit and i think when you put everything together you should arrive at trichotomy now i'm not trying to say here that um if you believe in uh, dichotomy you're wrong no and that is not my point. Uh, I don't have any problem with the fact that someone will believe in, in dichotomy. It doesn't really make a big difference as such. But where I have a, a problem, or not a problem, uh, where you will be challenged is that, uh, or what I believe is that, you will not be able to experience the entirety of God's mysteries when you do not consider the human being as composed of a body, spirit, and a soul. You're going to discover that when we dive into how God communicates to us. What is a spirit? The Bible says God is a spirit in the book of John. And um, the book of Hebrews says that God is the father of spirits. So there is no, there would be no confusion or no problem if we say that we are spirits because the Bible says that God created us in his image and now what does that imply it means that we are truly spirits it means that the flesh that we have this flesh that we have is not we the and the real us is a spirit being and what is specific about a spirit being is that 
it operates on the, uh, on a level um, known as the spirit realm. If you are a spirit, you can only operate on a realm known as the spirit. It makes sense because God tells us to serve him in spirit and in truth. If we are not able to serve God in spirit, we will have difficulties to, to be able to relate with him. And so God implores us, he tells us that if you want to really serve me in, in truth, you need to get into the spirit realm. That's where you are able to communicate or to discuss with me or to have a true relationship with me. The spirit operates on the spirit realm or in the spirit realm and uh, it communicates through a voice known as the conscience. Now, how do we know, how do we recognize things in the spirit? It's through the conscience. Everything appeals to the conscience. So one of the specifics of his conscience is that when something appeals to your conscience, it is true. It is, there is no doubt about it anymore. In the spirit, we just know that we know that we know. That's it. When God appears to Abraham, and Abraham hears that voice talking to him, he has no doubt. He just wakes up and he begins to obey because it's a fact, it's true. When uh, the servant of Elisha has doubts because they are surrounded by a group of people that are trying to kill them, open my servant's eyes that he may see uh, in the spirit realm and see what is going on there. And when his, this servant's eyes are open, he see all these chariots of fire and you know, you just know that you know. Um, when things happen in the spirit, they are real. Everything in the spirit is clearly real and it appeals to the conscience. And once your conscience is enlightened, it is enlightened. There is no doubt about it anymore because it's a fact. This doesn't matter whether you're rich or you're poor or you're learned or you're unlearned. Once um, you have a communication in the conscience, it's a fact. There are two spirit realms. There is the realm of light and the realm of darkness. All of them operate with the same principles. Um, if you are in the spirit, if you are in the light world, it means the light of the side of God, um, it, you will get urges that come to you from the Holy Spirit into your conscience. Or God will be able to communicate through you through angels and um, through other means. He may talk to you in dreams and uh, he may help you see visions and all that stuff. All those things, when you see a vision, and you just know it's real, it's true. There is nothing to argue about it, it's a fact. If an angel comes to talk to you, it's a fact. The same thing happens to the dark world. Those who have covenants with demons and all that stuff, you, you, sign your, you, you sell your soul to the devil and so you have all these spirits and marine spirits and all these demons that come to communicate with you. They tell you real stuff, um, go and uh, do such a thing and you'll get money and all that blah 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 and all that stuff. It's real, um, it, it all happens in the spirit realm. God, through the Holy Spirit, will communicate something to us. Maybe because we read a scripture or maybe because we ask for wisdom. And this revelation will come into our conscience and we just know that it is true. That's a fact. What we need to note here is that um, in the spirit realm, communication takes place through the voice of the conscience. And urges that come to our conscience are usually true. That's why Many people say that when your conscience tells you something, be careful. So when Ananias hears um, that voice to go to uh, the street called Straight and inquire of a man called you know, Saul of Tarsus for his praying, uh, it's a fact. There is nothing to argue about it. You know, he tries to say, oh, I've heard of this man and what he's doing to us Christians and so on and so forth. But um, yes, go and meet him for he is a chosen servant of mine. And I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for the gospel's sake. You know, that's a fact. There's nothing to argue. So we notice that in terms of the composition of a spirit, no one is able to determine what a spirit is. There is no one that has ever analyzed a spirit in a laboratory and to tell us this is what a spirit is composed of. That's insanity, you know. I don't think that we are able to understand the composition of spirit beings. There are many types of spirits. You have angelic spirits, you have us human beings, and you have God who is a spirit. No one knows what these entities are composed of. 
Um, there is no analysis, no laboratory that can do that type of analysis. And I don't believe that in this current setting we, can, we are able to determine that. Whenever we meet Jesus face to face, he's going to tell us, he's going to reveal these things to us. And I don't think it is necessary to get into all that type of research because it's not really useful in our current setting. What we need to know, however, is how spirits operate and the, the, the realm in which we operate. That is very useful because that is where um, the conscience and godly communication comes into play. Now, when we come to the soul, it is the same thing. Um, no one is able to determine what a soul is. Um, I mean, when you meditate on it, I've meditated on it many times and I'm asking myself, where is the soul situated? If I'm a spirit, and where, where is the soul situated? It's just, it just, sometimes it just doesn't make any sense at all. With a spirit, you know at least because the Bible says that we are spirits, you know, um, and that God is a spirit. So you know that the spirit is an entity. But you can't really tell whether the soul is an entity of its own or what is it exactly, is it a part? When it comes to, you know, the way the soul functions, then we have a reason to say something. The psychologists have been able to understand how the soul functions. And if you look at it clearly, the psychologists will tell you that the, the soul is made up of the mind, the will, and the emotions. Because of the way we act, we are able to determine these things. We are able to see these things in our lives even if we are not able to analyze or to analyze them in a laboratory or to define them clearly. While the spirits operate on a level known as the spirit realm, the soul is on the mental realm. Now what is the mental realm? The mental realm is a realm whereby we communicate through a voice known as, the, uh, known as reason. Remember in the spirit realm the communication process or voice is the conscience but in the realm of the soul or the mental realm we analyze things and we do that through reasoning everybody has access to the spirit world but it depends on the world in which you have access to you either have access to the dark world or the light world everybody has access to the mental realm because everybody can reason, everybody can do some sort of reasoning. In psychology, even in Christian psychology, that the mind is that part of the soul that stores information, it collects and stores information. And then we have the willpower, the capacity to use the information that is stored in the soul, in the mind. That is the willpower. And then you have the emotions. Emotions are just the way we react, the way uh, they accompany the actions or the decisions of the willpower. I was working for a company and I had a friend with whom we were working in this company together. And then one day, our employer called us and told us that our terms, uh, our contract terms are going to be modified. Instead of working 100%, we'll be working uh, 20 percent or 40 percent and so the implication was that we had to look for other jobs and then that my friend made an amazing statement he said I don't think I'll be able to find a job it's very difficult for me to find a job and then I asked why and then he said um, because when you cross 40 it's very difficult to find a job in Switzerland and I said well I don't think it's uh, very difficult. I believe that if you search, you're going to find a job. Now, what happened? It happened that when this, when this guy came to Switzerland, he read all these articles that say that if you have crossed 40, it becomes really difficult to find a job in Switzerland. And he read this information and he collected this information and stored it in the mind. But as long as he had a job and everything was going well, you know, he, um, this information was just there in the mind. It was, it was being, it was just dormant. Um, a time came when um, this information had to be used, and then the willpower said, "Oh, look, uh, there is a certain information uh, that is in the mind, and um, now you have crossed 40, and you will not be able to find a job in Switzerland." So the the willpower went into the into the mind and collected this information and brought it forward and what the emotions and I could see the way he was talking he was talking with so much sadness and um, that those are the emotions that were in play and he was so so discouraged and so paralyzed by this by the entire situation and I was 
just there trying to encourage him and say, well, it doesn't really matter. I believe that you can still find a job. Um, what is 40? 40, you're still young. Come on. <laughs> there are so many places where you can work here. Forget about all what those articles are saying. You know, but he was not a believer. I couldn't really get into the details of saying, oh, you know, um, with God all things are possible and blah, blah, and all that stuff. Because I knew that he was not a believer. I've been try I had been trying to preach the gospel to him. And so that is how the whole, the entire process works. We know that that is the way it, it happens. That's, that's how the soul functions. But we are not able to really define what the soul is. Now, what does that imply? Um, it is very dangerous to trust the communication process of the soul. Why? Because it appeals to reasoning. Now, you remember in the spirit, you just know that you know because you get a revelation. When things are revealed, it is clear. It is purely, it is just the truth. It's a fact. You have nothing to argue about. But when you come to the, to the realm of the soul, um, the realm, the mental realm, we have to reason everything. We have to analyze everything. And uh, you know what happens with analysis. Analysis require that we use objectivity. And sometimes we do not do a rational analysis or an objective analysis. And so the analysis leads to um, wrong conclusions. And so what happens is that if our analysis is not good, the, re the entire reasoning process is a mess. Why does that happen? It happens because the mind is not selective of the type of information it collects. It collects all information from wherever. I don't care how spiritual you are, whether your faith is as strong as that of Elijah or as weak as that of Thomas. If you watch pornography, those images remain intact in your mind, you know. They get stored there in your mind and at some point, you would, when an opportunity arises, you will go into your mind and bring that information out. That's a red light there. The mind is not selective of the type of information it collects in the mind. It collects and gathers and stores any type of information we are exposed to. And that is why many people will tell you, you know, don't get exposed to just whatever. If you see pornography, don't click, don't, don't get into that stuff. When you find things that are uh, not glorifying God, don't get into that stuff, you know. Because when you get into it, the more you get into it, the more you keep collecting all that information and you store uh, that bad information in your mind. And then it will help you to take wrong decisions later. So the reasoning process is based on the information that we have in mind. We cannot reason uh, based on what we do not have based on what we do not know. So our reasoning process will always um, have a conclusion based on the information that we have in the mind. So if we collect um, untrue information or insufficient information, our reasoning process is going to be insufficient and it's always going to be untrue. And so that's why it is important that we uh, store good information in our mind. So how do we make the reasoning process effective? So we read the Bible, which is the foundation of scientific truth. You know, we know that um, everything that is in the Bible is real. And then we go to real scientific sources outside of the Bible to be able to gather information that we need. If you are pregnant, for instance, go to true sources of scientific uh, information on pregnancy. And then you are able to, to get this information so that you are able to reason and arrive at conclusions that are rational. Otherwise, the whole entire reasoning process is a mess. So that's a caution right there. We cannot trust the reasoning process uh, that goes on in the mental realm as, uh, as facts all the time. We have to make sure that we do an objective analysis. So when you are looking for your spouse, you're going to do a lot of reasoning. You're going to collect a lot of information from all over and you're going to analyze that information. The next part of a human being is a body and that body operates on this physical world, in this physical realm that we live in, that looks so real but at the same time it is less real than the spirit realm. <laughs> Most of the things that we do in the physical world, 
they do happen in the spirit realm, in the spirit realm and in the mental realm before they happen in the physical world. Even my forefathers who believed in demons understood this reality. They always poured libations to um, on their graves to invoke spirits. Why? They believed and they knew that the spirit world is more real. Is more real. The only difference is that they were in the dark world. They were in the dark spirit world. They believed all these demonic entities and all this traditional stuff. We know that most of the things that happen uh, in the physical world have already taken place in the spirit realm. Before we pursue certain acts in the physical world, we have already risen these things in the mental realm. That is also a fact. That's real. You don't just act like that. You don't wake up and just act. You first reason, you know. And before you reason, you get a revelation. And that revelation will come either from the light world or from the dark world. And this is where it becomes really sad because most of the information we know about the human being is not on the level of the spirit. And then the mental realm, uh, so many of us are there, but you see all the battles. And so all the worldviews that we have, all the ideologies that are coming up in the world, all the political arguments, all the debates that we have on so and so view and so on and so forth. All these things appeal to reasoning. And so of course there is a level of revelation that appeals to that. If you are writing a book for instance, um, you need to get a revelation from, God, from either God or the devil. And then you use reasoning to drop the idea down in a book. But unfortunately, most of the knowledge that we know about a human being is on the level of the physical. Modern medicine, for instance, has gone into greater depths to explore the human being's composition of a body. I mean, the body is so known that people, we uh, conduct complex surgeries in order to fix certain anomalies. Scientists that do not know God, that do not believe in God, they, they think that they know so much of a human being because they understand the body. But what happens is that the body is just housing <laughs> the spirit and the soul, which is the real you. That is why if you die, the body gets rotten. But we know that the spirit and the soul continue to live and you, you either go to hell or in, uh, to be with God. How does the body communicate? The body communicates through the five senses and those are the feelings. This is the worst means of communication you can ever think of. I mean, if you do, um, in the spirit realm, we get revelations and we know they are true. And in the mental realm, if you do a good analysis um, with reason, good reasoning, you arrive at truth. But in the physical realm, even when someone is crying, I'm dying, I'm dying, you need to be careful. <laughs> because the person can be trapping you while crying, I'm dying, I'm dying, help me, you know. Everything in the physical realm needs to go through thorough scrutiny before you come to determine uh, whether it's true or not. And so if we would just appeal to the spiritual and mental, we'll be able to determine what we see in the physical easily. It's so sad that when we are looking for a spouse, when most of us are looking for a spouse, we are get carried away by all these feelings and emotions. You remember that we said uh, we, do not, we, do not, we do not want to get into all that stuff. And this is the reason why, because feelings are very deceptive. Everything, you know, you, it's true that when you date, you want to touch, you want to kiss, you want to do all that stuff. But that, all that appeals just to, you know, simple emotions. Uh, you know, the feelings, the body always is that part that always wants to feel good. It wants to get good food, it wants to wear good clothes, it wants to, you know, be on the position of enjoyment, enjoying all that stuff, all that nonsense. But that is not what God wants for us. He wants us to live in the spirit. It's not foolish to say that, you know, um, walk in the spirit and you will not glorify the deeds of the flesh, you know, because the flesh wants to feel good. The flesh is always contrary to the things of the spirit. While in the spirit, you get good revelations, you get amazing revelations, you get what is really necessary for you for life. When you come down to the physical world, you get the opposite. So the body communicates through feelings and feelings are, are the worst means of communication 
we can ever think of because they are very deceptive. As you can see, you have a relationship with God. There are things that God is going to reveal to your conscience in the spirit realm. As you read the Bible, if you're grounded in the Bible, that's the first thing you need to do. Read your Bible. Understand what marriage is, what God says about marriage. And then God is going to speak specific things to you concerning your walk with Him. And as you walk with Him, um, you're going to step out there to interact with people, of course. And as you step out there to interact with people, you're going to do some analysis, you're going to do some reasoning, you're going to get into that mental realm, or it may be someone that doesn't appeal to your conscience at all. But then, um, that is the person that God wants. But then you have to reach that state in the spirit whereby uh, the person has to appeal to your conscience. You know, <laughs> you may f find yourself in these scenarios. And so, once you are grounded by the Word of God and uh, you can get revelations, God is going to reveal certain things to you. That's a fact. The Bible says, faith without works is dead being alone. We can't say we have faith and keep there waiting for a dream to come and uh, waiting for a specific revelation or um, an amazing, you know, vision. That's not the way it happens most of the time. We have to understand the times in which we are living. We are living in times whereby we have a Bible and God expects, expects us to primarily go to that Bible to look for the information that we need for life. And then as we do that, he's going to help guide us with some revelations. We are not in the, in the era whereby you expect dreams all the time. You want to be able to, to, to have visions all the time. No, because God expects you to read the Bible first. That is his primary means of communication. He wants to speak to your conscience, you know. You know, you don't put emotions aside. Remember we said we are not electric poles. Um, we have to enjoy the time that we, we spend with the person that we are dating or that we are interacting with. Uh, we want to do organize some mountain trips. We want to be able to eat some good food together, to cook together, to play together, to do some stuff together. But we know very well that that is not the primary means of guardians. Just because we move along does not mean that God wants us to, <laughs> to spend the rest of our lives with. Just because everything is going well doesn't mean there is a good connection. Be careful because marriage is something entirely different. It's a lifelong story. You know, you're kind of on the moon enjoying all that stuff, eating good food, moving along, <laughs> climbing the mountains, hiking together, boat trips, traveling, blah, blah, blah. But that's not marriage. Enjoy the time you spend together. But then, you know, your primary source of uh, guardians is at the level of the conscience. God is going to speak to you. He's going to give you green and red lights. And then you're going to use some sort of reasoning, uh, analyze the situation. And believe me, if you are a true child of God, you're just going to know that you know that you know. You may not be able to explain it to those that question your choice. You may not be able to explain everything, but at the end of the day, you will live a fulfilled marriage. You will see in the marriage that God guided you. You will know that God guided you. And at the end of the day, you will see how your marriage is bearing fruits. I hope this video was useful. Uh, as you know, we are trusting God to build a Christian community. If you didn't subscribe to the channel, I please beg you to subscribe. Um, also share the information with those that are in your own community so we may help edify one another. As you do so, God bless you. Watch out for the next video.